We're here today to talk about easy use as it applies to small computers. Easy use is a subject everybody talks about, nobody knows anything about it except me and shortly you because I will tell you. Uh, we have two jobs here. I have one, you have the other. My job is to present this information, yours is to listen to it. If you get through with your job before I get through with mine, I would appreciate you sitting patiently until I'm done. Easy use. These are headquarters charts. You can tell they're headquarters charts because they are in color. It says information development, audio visual presentation. I will do both the audio and the video. Before I can go much further into easy use, I have to teach you something about the IBM Data Master. I know it's late in the day and learning is tough for anybody, but you're going to have to pay close attention to two charts on the subject. Number one shows the six applications we built for Data Master. They are billing, inventory, accounts receivable, general ledger, accounts payable, and payroll. And they are commonly called Bicar Glapper. Everybody knows about Bicar Glapper, not vigorously. Yes, by car glapper. Friends, let me tell you what I mean. You got one, two, three, four, five, six packaged applications. Applications that make the difference between defeat and victory with a capital V, rhymes with B, and it stands for by car glapper. Now, I know all you folks are the right kind of people. I'm going to be perfectly frank. You want to know what kind of thoughts go on ahead of a prospect when he comes to you? Well, he's thinking about price, thinking about function, thinking about can my operator do it? Well, friends, I'm here to tell you the price is low, the function is high, and anybody cannot run a data master application cannot tie his shoes. But I want to direct your attention to the two little blue boxes. The blue box in the upper right-hand corner is word processing. That's a combination hardware-software product built in Boca Raton, and it works with externally defined data. Store that for a moment. The blue box down below is a database product called Brad's 3 that also works from externally defined data, and it was built in Menlo Park, California. Now, the applications in the middle, by Car Glapper, remember those, built here in Atlanta, and they ship with the product externally defined definitions for their files. And those definitions in all three cases are identical, which means that three development locations over 30 months of development actually spoke to each other once. If you've been around a long time, you know how rare that is. These applications all work together. The little arrows show that they do. And you'd say, well, of course they all work together. Only a fool would do otherwise. Friends, let me tell you that in the past we haven't been all together crisp about that. But in this set of applications, they are integrated, interrelated, and work together. I'm going to teach you how to operate Data Master. There it is. Two diskette slots. Programs go in slot one, data goes in slot two, and you have to type PROC menu, nine characters, the center of one of which is a space. The space bar is six inches long and easy to find. That's what you type to bring up General Ledger. What do you think you type to bring up accounts payable? PROC menu. Brad's three, proc menu. Word processing, proc menu. Three things to remember. My human factors people tell me you can remember seven things in short-term memory, but I won't tax you. Three is all you have to remember. Programs in one, data in two, proc menu. And if you cross your hands when putting the diskettes in, it still works. Now that was a non-trivial thing to make happen, but it was done in pursuit of ease of use. Here comes the definition. Ease of use is multiple paths to the same desirable goal. We tell you how to do that. Programs in one, data in two, but if you make a natural error, it's okay. That's one example of ease of use. Another one has to do with a, a 10 keypad on a keyboard where you can use these numbers if you're more familiar with an adding machine keyboard, or you can use the numbers across the top if you're more familiar with a typewriter. Both of those things should work the same. That's easy use. Programs in one, data in two, proc menu, and now you're running Data Master. I want to talk to you for the few minutes now about the books and support of the applications. Our technology has not yet evolved to where we can eliminate the printed word in support of application programs. We're going to do that someday, but right now we're shipping a few pages along with these applications. There are the applications, all six of them down the right-hand side, and these are the book titles we shipped to support those, 14,000 some odd pages. And before you think that sounds like a lot of pages, let me tell you that about half of those pages are in a logic manual which contains no information that any of our customers can possibly make any use of. We printed those because if you're going to modify the application or if you really care about the insides of how it works, you need to know that. But it's optional material and we don't ship it to you unless you really want it. When writing the publications, we did some revolutionary things for the IBM company. We had writers write the books. 
Now, I know you'll say that seems ridiculous. Of course, writers wrote the books, but in years past, our information development process was that programmers wrote a draft and the writers punched it up, put it in proper syntax and organized it right. In this case, we had writers who were not professional computer people, but were professional writers, trained with the programmers along the development cycle, writing the books in parallel to the code. So when we got to the end, we had code that worked and books that worked. And we're gonna continue that trend in the future. We had the writers produce a set of models, and those models were used by all the application writers so that when you picked up a running book from accounts payable, it looked something like the running book from accounts receivable. So as a customer, when you've installed one app, you go to install your second, it's a breeze. That was the plan. We had the same guidelines you'll see talked about for the next 10 years. Simplify the vocabulary, get rid of the data processing terms, write at an eighth grade level, use declarative sentences, use active voice. Now, uh, active voice is probably the most important single thing you can do in a book to make it useful. And it is something foreign to the way people are taught to write in schools. Teachers in schools are impressed with big words, complex sentences. People who are trying to learn something aren't. And so we took the language back a level. We wrote an eighth grade level. An eighth grade level is that of the typical high school graduate in the United States. That is not a joke. In Georgia, it is a typical college graduate, but that's another story. I keep this bullet on the chart to remind myself never to let this happen again. This is not a benefit. This is a detriment. We had no separate editors. And to the extent that the books for accounts payable and the books for general ledger are not identical in their organization and layout and style, it is because of no separate editing pass. The writers produce the education as well as the books. Here in the center, we write an application. The operator training and so forth is part of the package, and we do that here too. The books don't teach accounting. We assume you, Mr. Customer, have a going business and you know how to do accounts receivable manually. We simply show you how to use our machine to accomplish that. Now, Mr. and Ms. Customer, you are to be congratulated for your wisdom in purchasing accounts payable for your new data master. In this little box right here, under a cubic foot and volume, is everything you and your operator needs to know to make intelligent use of this application. When you open the box, the first thing you find in there is a piece of paper that says, read this first. And if you drop it on the deck, it says, read this first on the back. Now, everybody always chuckles. Those of you who know printing know that it costs nothing to do that. That piece of paper went through the press, right? Nothing to do that. We found during our testing, at about half the time, the people who packed the box put it upside down, and the people who got the box threw it away without ever reading it because they thought it was packing material. So we helped try to fix that. And I only point this out to show you the attention to detail we tried to put into this product so that a customer could use it without IBM assistance. First thing you find in this box is a book with a big number one on it. I will tell you in advance, these books are numbered one, two, three and four. Now you would think that if I gave you four, box, four books and you were to open it up, you'd instinctively turn to book number one, right? In our test, half the people chose some other book besides book number one. One of the things this piece of paper tells you is open book number one. By the way, this piece of paper tells you how to unpack this box. Some people were concerned that we might insult the intelligence of one of our users by talking down, and you can do so. You can talk down to people, you will lose them. We don't talk down to them, but we talk nose to nose at them at a very low level. Because a data processing <laughs> ignorant customer, which most of them are, and they'll admit that to you too, want to know what to do. They want to be productive quickly, they want early victories, and it's our job in this in this unpacking this box, the very first thing you do to give you victories. So it tells you to open book number one. When you do that, you find a couple of things. Bound in the front of book number one is a little 50-page book called Introducing Accounts Payable. And in it is every word you need to know about getting started with this application. That is to say, if you're the owner of the business, it talks to you. If you're the operator, it talks to you. It defines the audience for the books, who's to do what and when. It also defines the data processing terms that we had to leave in the application. My objective for my writers was no data processing terms. We uh, took a word list we were planning to use to a bunch of sixth graders here in town, and we asked them to write down the meanings of the words they knew, and they thought that field was another word for meadow, and that key was something with which you unlock the door. Uh, I can't understand how they could be taught that in school, but that's what they all thought. So we learned quickly that we couldn't just use things we've been using all along and expect the non data processing literate person to grab a hold of that. So we managed to eliminate all the data processing terms in the books except four. 
And we define those, book, those words in this book. Field, record, file, diskette. Diskette was easy. There is no parallel in nature to the word diskette. Field, record, file had to be defined in our, uh, in our context. And that's what's in here. And this book is separately bound. It's a saddle stitch, so you can take it out of here and use it as a promo. And as a matter of fact, the field does exactly that. We ship those separately as well. The rest of volume one are the learning exercises for accounts payable. We ship a sample data set with this code from PID. And that sample data set is for North Creek Industries, a fictional company. And you use these learning materials with the live code and that data set to learn how to use the app so you can't mess anything up. Okay? That's what that's about. And there's a half a dozen or more exercises by application. In the back of the book, you will find a couple of audio cassettes. A lot of people said, hey, audio is not necessary. Okay? A lot of people who said there were people over 40 who didn't grow up with transistor radios plastered to the sides of their heads. The younger folks in our world are used to audio all the time. And so the audio assist was put in here to make those people more productive more quickly. Our test showed while only about 30% of the people used the audio, they were more productive more quickly than the people who didn't. We wrote it in such a way that the audio is an adjunct to the books. You don't have to take the audio to take the books. It's not an integral part, but it does help, and our testing showed that it did. This is for training your operator, book number one. And after you've trained the operator, it's on the shelf. It's not used again until you train another operator, which in a data master counts about once every six weeks. That's not a data master statement. That's a small business statement. Second thing you find here is a book with a big number two on the binder. These are the installing tasks to tailor this application to the data master. Data master only has two million bytes of storage not over large in size, and so if you're going to have more than one application on the machine, you need to tailor the application so that they get maximum fit. Now, if you fit what we think you're like, Mr. Customer, two buttons installs you, two keystrokes. But if you're not, these are the tasks that you can do to tailor the application file sizes to fit your account. Now, once you've done that, that book is on the shelf and not used again. Book number three is the operator reference manual. Got a big number three. Did I pull the right one? Yes, book number three is the operator reference manual. And everything the application does is documented in this book, every single thing. There are tabs, as you see in there, and the tabs reflect the menu options on the screen. Tab number three is menu option number three. Okay? And it's there so that if you have a doubt about how to run an option, it's in this book. Now, this book is usually kept out by the computer for the first six or eight weeks until people discover that the screens are so good that you don't have to refer to the book very often. Let me give you a good example, though, in payroll, writing W-2s at the end of the year. If we trained you to write a W-2, you'd clearly forget by the time you had to run once. It's a once-a-year job. So it's documented in here how to do it, but it's not in the learning materials. Okay? But it's out by the computer for a while. You love your ugly children the most. You have to. No one else will. This is book number four. It's entitled Using Accounts Payable Information. When we were building this product, people came to me and said, we don't need this book because this book is for the person using the output that comes off the computer. How to read the reports. And I said, not true, friends. People don't understand the wealth and wonder that we've given them in these programs, and you've got to tell them what the reports are good for. And that's what this book is. I was vindicated. In all the freedom shows we did in 81 and 82, I got more comments, positive comments from prospects and customers about the existence of this volume than the rest of the library. So this book tells you how to use the output that comes off the machine. But it's not for the operator. It's for the owner or operator of the business, and it's not out by the computer either. Here's a good idea. The predecessor product for Data Master was the 5120, and before that, the 5110, and before that, the 5100. And in that time frame, when the machine would stop, there were 11 different places you could go to find out why. The, ma the manual messages were scattered throughout the library. Someone said, why don't we put all the messages together for this machine? And so Boca Raton ships with the machine a binder that says messages on it. It's loose leaf, and it's got all the reasons why the hardware might stop. Okay? With each application, we ship an insert for that book with a tab that says accounts payable, and all the reasons accounts payable might stop. And on that piece of paper I'm not reading to you, it tells you how to take this, put it in the book, in the binder for the machine that comes with the box, and now you have all the messages in one place. What a good idea, yes? I was making this presentation to a Teach the Teachers class back in July of 81. Someone in the back of the room said, wait a minute, why did you do that? I know I'm running accounts payable when the machine stops. Why didn't you put those in the running book for accounts payable? Thinking quickly, I said, go ahead. They're three-hole drilled in the same size. And if it's more comfortable for you to have them in that book as opposed to this book, that's easy use. 
multiple paths to the same desirable goal. So you'll find data master accounts with the messages in the running book. And you'll find it in with the rest of the messages, and that's great. Whatever's right for you is right for us. Finally, when you get your diskettes from PID, for years we've been telling people, make a copy of those diskettes, put the major original diskettes in a safe place. We ship a safe place. This is an empty holder that holds the diskettes that come from PID. It's shaped to fit under the mattress at home, so it will be safe for you forevermore. And that's what's in the box. Let me reprise this for you. When you go to a Data Master account, you will find this out by the machine for the applications, the rest of it on the shelf. Here it is. Book number one's got the introducing and the learning materials and the audio tapes, which are optional. Actually, they're there, but their use is optional. The installing materials, the running operator reference, the using materials, the messages insert for the messages manual, and down here at the bottom is the application logic manual. In payroll, that book is eight and a half by 11, black and white, two side, three hole drill, corner stapled with a staple this long because it's 900 pages long. And it's again for the person who's gonna modify that application. If I have only one success in life, it was getting that shippable optionally, so you don't get it unless you ask for it. It is my plan in the future to make it available at a charge, to discourage the people from depopulating the great American Northwest from trees. That information has to be produced, but it doesn't have to be produced for everyone. Here's the library. Each application has its own color. There are six of them. Remember the pitch before? Building inventory and so forth. There they are, all six of them, different colors. Curious uh, thing I'll tell you about. Those were originally printed on color vinyl, white silkscreen on colored vinyl, and we almost couldn't ship payroll because there was an international shortage of green vinyl. Now, you don't go to a systems manager in IBM and explain you're going to miss first customer ship because of an international shortage of green vinyl, so that's never going to happen again. You can see from these books here that they are now a standard binder with a paper insert, so that problem won't occur again. I want to talk to you about how we got these books to be so good. We built good books. We proved they were good before they got to the field by a test I want to tell you about. We ran our human factors facility here in Atlanta. These tests that run down here are things that we do naturally in the development process. And the test over here is a thing called user-oriented system test run by a separate assurance group as a pass-fail. You get down here, if you don't pass this test, you don't ship the product. The test I'm going to tell you about is this one right here that we inserted into the process to make sure that when we got to here, we wouldn't fail. It's called the hands-on test. We ran our human factors facility. This is our human factors facility as it looked in the uh, first quarter of 1981. About 1,000 square feet, a control room, one-way glass videotape equipment, and a bay that could be set up any way we liked. We set it up as a pair of offices, tried to emulate an office environment. Here's a very bad slide of the human factors room. Each frame of videotape, we got five pieces of information. Count them five. You've already had to learn three, four, and five. This is five. Five pieces of information. First, you see a picture of the test subject doing what the test subject was doing. And superimposed on that, you have a screen that is exactly what the test subject is seeing on her screen. So you see exactly what she sees, and you see her seeing it. Up in the corner, you have the date and the time. And we could use that for timing various things. And there are two audio tracks that run on this tape. One of them from a live microphone in the test facility. So if the operator says, oh, fudge, you have that captured for all time. And another one from the test administrator inside the control room narrating what's going on. After the first few days, we found that the, when you, all the t frames look the same, it's hard to tell where you are. So we put an audio track in there so we'd be able to locate what we're doing. Why did we do this, you might ask? Why did we did this, be, thank you, we did this to ensure that we had built a usable product. Down here at the bottom, you see technical accuracy. We weren't worried about technical accuracy. We have been building programs for a long time here, and we can build technically accurate publications and technically accurate code. What we have not any real experience in is ensuring that that stuff is usable when it gets to the field. I try tried, I tried to make this analysis. When I, if you're a programmer and you're given a module to write, and you're told that by specification this is supposed to be 2 plus 2 equals 4, at the end it's easy to test to see if you made it. You put in two and two and four comes out the back, you won. If you're a writer, it is possible to be technically accurate and still not usable. 
Just being right isn't enough anymore. We wanted to find out if people could find the information to perform a task quickly, if when they found it, it was enough, it wasn't too much, was it clear, was the vocabulary suitable for the people who were going to use it. That's what we wanted to find out. We had no preconceived notions except we knew this was going to be a rubber stamp. I mean, we've been building things for a long time. We're expert at this. But we want to do this just to make sure. We want a simulated office environment, and we want to determine if we had a problem or not. And the way we chose to do this, we brought in eight test subjects in three groups. Let me tell you about test subjects. Test subjects think, get this now, that they are being tested. It's hard to explain to someone brought in as a test subject that failure is not their fault. It's our fault. Tough. More about that later. These are the characteristics for the test subjects we chose. High school graduate, business knowledge, some accounting experience, no computer training, and a mixture of ages. We got those specifications directly out of the audience requirement statement for Data Master. People like that are the people expected to use this product. We got six from temporary agencies and two from SRA in Chicago. What did we get for our trouble? We got 400 hours of videotape. Now, I, I will tell you that the real intrinsic value of 400 hours of videotape is practically nothing. It isn't collection of hours and hours of videotape that's important. It's the information contained thereon. What we got, we got the videotapes, of course. We got comments from observers. That little control room was packed with people interested in what was going on in there. We got comments from the test subjects because besides a live microphone while they were working, we debriefed them every day and said, how did it go today? Stop sobbing. Tell us what's wrong. Okay. Test subjects could be reassured day after day after day that it wasn't their fault if things weren't going well, and it's real hard for them. That's why we have psychologists on the staff here. So what happened? The hands-on test was done, and the first test group couldn't do it. They failed. We failed. It failed. They couldn't do it. I've been IBM now for 21 years. I knew what was wrong with that. We had the wrong test subjects. We brought some more test subjects in, and they couldn't do it either. Well, let me tell you, it was pretty grim around here around April of 81. We're going to announce to ship this machine in July. Here we are in April. And the people we described as being the users of this product couldn't use it. Pretty tough. So we analyzed what was wrong. There were really only two things wrong. And we stopped the test. And we did six months of work in about six weeks. We rebuilt the materials. And we brought in a third group. And they breezed it. And as a matter of fact, everybody else has breezed it who's touched it. It was so obvious what was wrong that it's amazing we got that far down the road without knowing it ourselves. And I'll tell you what that was. In fact, I'll tell you what that was right now. I mentioned before we have learning materials and running materials. It was our thought at the time that the learning book should simply point you into the running book for detailed information and come back. And that way you would learn to use the running book while you were taking the training. Now, that sounds like a good idea. What we found is that once we sent them over there, they never came back. They're lost. It's like sending somebody to Poughkeepsie by telling people six rights, three lefts, and right at the T, and if you make one mistake, you're in Denver. Well, that's what happened to people. We were able to recognize that, and the way we solved it was to take pages out of here and embed them in here so people did not have to change books to do the tasks, and that worked great. It contributed to the number of pages, okay, a digression. They came to me and they said, we'd like to make these books a little smaller, physically smaller than you're used to seeing in IBM. And I said, OK, that sounds good. The machine's small and friendly desktop. And they said, and we'd like to have more white space and more graphics than we've had before. And I said, I, I support that. That's good. And they said, let's make the type size 10% larger than we've ever used before for readability. And I said, hey, that's a good idea. I buy that. And they said, let's use an eighth grade vocabulary, short sentences, small words. And I said, hey, that's groovy. And then they said, let's make the books thinner. And I said, hold everything. Because everything you've agreed to just till up till now contributes to books being thicker. And so that's a way of life. If you're going to write this way, you're going to have more pages than a casual observer would like to look at. But if you break them down to bite-sized pieces, it hasn't caused a problem. And it didn't. I will tell you a story now about this test, and I will show you six minutes of videotape, then I'll be through. We had seven test subjects who were women and one who was a man. This story is about the man. It embarrasses me to tell you this, being a man myself, but he was on page two of the Learning Data Master publication. And the instructions in the book said, take a diskette from its protective envelope. 
Now, the protective envelope stayed in the box, as it often does, and all he had in his hands was this, and he read the paragraph again. Remove the diskette from its protective envelope. So he did. Now, he didn't do it quite as dramatically as that. You're going to see it on the videotape. But it is an ex I went to Poughkeepsie with this story, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, we've been, people have been tearing these things up for years. <laughs> years. So, I, so we changed the book, the Data Master book, the Bocas book, was changed to say, we'll have a graphic, a picture that said, this is the envelope, this is the diskette. Problem went away. Everybody laughed. That guy tore that diskette up. Six of the eight people tried to tear up the diskette. Only he was strong enough. That's the fact. Show you six minutes of videotape and get to the close. The fellow who assembled this videotape for me selected the music. It's called The Dance of the Comedians. I don't know why he chose that. He doesn't work for me anymore. It used to be the theme song for Cisco Kid on television in 1950. This is a series of vignettes. There are four of them, a total of six minutes in length, to try to illustrate the major points I was making about how this stuff looks and how you can make use of it. The first test subject was our sharpest test subject. When she had trouble, we began to worry. We had test subjects of all levels of ability in terms of natural ability with computers, and this person had the most, and she had problems. We stopped the test after an hour of her sitting and looking at one screen to find out why. We had originally planned not to do that. that difficult to do? Um, when you're on one thing, you have a tendency to keep going without going back in and say, oh, God, I was supposed to stop. And there are three back and do something different. She's got three books open, this one, this one, and one behind her. And then when I do get into a jam, I don't know how to get back to it to correct it. Like, I was skipping fields and everything there. And the second vignette is what we saw her doing that prompted us to stop the test to go ask her what was wrong. This is where she was. Now, she doesn't say anything. We ask the test subjects to, uh, to, speak, to speak out loud when they had a disturbance and say what was bothering them, say what they were thinking so we'd have a record of it. She didn't do that. What she's supposed to do now is press enter. That's what she's supposed to do. You'll notice a book open back here and two books open here. And though she says nothing, I want you to watch her body language to, to illustrate how videotape is a wonderful medium for finding out people really feel. Now watch your hand. That woman is annoyed. When we debriefed her that afternoon, the nice thing about test subjects is they like to, they like to spare your feelings. They won't tell you how they really feel. Um, going step by step on exercise three was the absolute hit. It was terrible. <laughs> Why was that? It just was totally confusing. We went from step by step to the tape and the book through the first exercise fine. Second exercise, fine. We get into number three, and it's just like, you know, pulling the diving board out from under you and throwing it in the pool. They'll tell you when they hurt. This next one is my favorite, besides the fellow with the diskette. This person is taking the audio training. I'll turn it down so you can hear me. The audio tape is telling her to type in an invalid customer number. So she'll see what happens in real life when she types in an invalid customer number. So she's... 14900. When she hits enter, she gets an error message down here, and the field is lit up in reverse image. And the customer number is now shown in reverse image. Now, we edited this tape because she stayed there for 18 minutes, rewinding the tape and listening to that sentence. And the customer number is now shown in reverse image. 18 minutes. Finally, she gave up and called the hotline, which is us. Supposed to be in reverse image? Yep. What does reverse image 
What does reverse image mean to you? What does she think? To me, it means the um, letters would be backwards. To her, the letters would be backwards. Everybody went guffaw, guffaw, guffaw. What's wrong with that woman? All eight people thought the letters would look as if in a mirror. They didn't know why we would have done a thing like that, but that's what they thought the reverse image means. We changed the book to define reverse image as, when we say reverse image, we mean black letters on a green background. Problem went away. But everybody thought the same thing. That's how I beamers can be too close to the forest, friends. This woman spoke out loud when she had a problem. She just talked as if there was somebody listening. For the record, please also note that I am very dissatisfied with the fact that the screen <laughs> does not tell me I have more invoices. And if the book had not told me that I have more than four invoices, I would never have, have noticed that this customer owed more than, than was on the first screen. What would you do about a thing like that? The book is right. The code is right. She didn't know. We had the code changed, a little line put right here that says, press enter for more. That's the sort of thing you can learn when you have real people using your product. And finally, this is the chap with the diskette. Even the sounds of opening a disk and envelope are dramatic, aren't they? The guys in the control room are going crazy. Get the remote camera on his hands. Get the remote camera on his hands. Now, he doesn't think that's right. But that's what he was told to do. It doesn't show on the tape, but what finally stopped him was the next instruction was, take the diskette by one corner. He said, hadn't got any corners. It's round. But what did I get for my trouble, friends? For one thing, I got early warning that I was in the ditch. This product would have failed in the marketplace if I had shipped it the way it was in April of 81. I got a terrific negotiating tool. Planning manager comes to a writer and says, the people can't do your stuff. There's no argument when you've got people in tears on videotape. You got a tremendous communications vehicle, as this meeting represents, and we saved a little bit of money, $170,000, on this project alone. The lab only cost me $90,000 to build, so I more than paid for it the first pass over the target, and I've still got it. Well, that's my story. Easy use is multiple paths, the same desirable goal, the best thing we've ever done in that respect is the Data Master Applications, and I'll thank you for your time.